Welcome everybody to another Game Dev Roundtable here on the Game Wisdom channel where we examine the art and science of games. We have a, another topic for this month that we'll be discussing with our roundtable. So as always, we'll go around our little room and introduce each other, I or introduce ourselves. I am Josh Bleiser, the owner of Game Wisdom, where I talk about the art and science of games. I am an author with my next book due out in August on free-to-play design, and I spend a lot of time talking about game design mechanics. I'll send it over to Tomo. Hi guys, uh, Tomo Moriwaki. Um... Uh, one of the founders of Hyperkinetic Studios, um, been a game designer for, I guess, starting to, all my life is starting to become a very reasonable <laughs> way to describe it. And um, we have a game in uh, Steam Early Access called Epic Tavern, which is all about systematizing storytelling. All right. And down to Seth. Hey, I'm Seth Goldberg. I've uh, been a uh, game developer probably for about 15 years and a developer in general for about 37 so um wargaming for for all my life since i was 13. i currently run a project called the strategy informer where i do discovery on strategy games and uh, i also do some uh, pr and design work for strategy mill all right and Ramin. Uh, my name is Ramin Shokrizad. I've been uh, developing the fields of game economics and meta design since around 2005. I did the meta design for Project Spark, uh, World of uh, Warships, World of Tanks Blitz, and uh, I'm co-founder now of Aravant. We're a uh, company that's merging AAA uh, games as a service with, uh, with blockchain uh, meta design so that we can uh, provide a more complex, uh, comprehensive experience. They're probably the opposite of what we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> All right, yeah, and we got a very interesting one. And it's definitely interesting because we have two people on the panel who are heavy war gamers who are not used to streamline and easy-to-understand mechanics and systems. <laughs> but... Our topic is discussing simplifying and streamlining mechanics and systems. This is something that uh, Tomo and I were talking about when we were doing our chat on Heroes Hour and the whole, we, uh, we couldn't come up with a clever name, like King's Bounty likes uh, style of games. This idea of taking bits and pieces of other genres and kind of getting them as small or as refined as possible and then applying that to other games, other designs, and so on. And kind of from that talk, I guess where we can really begin or where we can kind of focus on would definitely be the integration of roguelike and even just RPG mechanics and systems in games. There's been this joke that every video game these days is in fact an RPG because every game has stats and some kind of profile account and itemization and progression. So anything from Forza to Call of Duty to even, I'm sure like one of the cooking games at some point will probably be an RPG in some way, shape or form. So I guess for the group, in terms of simplifying, where do you see like some of like your favorite genres or your favorite games have gone? in terms of either removing complicated elements or borrowing elements from other games? And like, what are your thoughts on it? I can actually, um, even, even being a war gamer, I can actually get into some simplifying stuff. But some of the stuff that I'm seeing lately, um, like Burden of Command is adding in uh, RPG systems into the war game itself and it's simplifying uh the war game rules mm -hmm. there's been other things in the past like close combat that also does like a morale system and a command system uh that that adds some rpg style uh elements into it so i can see that that moving forward and kind of uh you know taking the traditional hex and counter approach and then bringing it over to the other side. Also, there's, um, there's some war games like Pavlov's uh, House uh, that simplify the, the encounters and the rule sets. Uh, Valor and Victory simplifies you know, the basic 
wargaming uh, uh, hex encounter system. So, you know, there, there is some room in wargaming for it to be simplified and still maintain a strategic balance. Well, and I might go a so, good experience. I might go so far as to say that's always going to be present, right? It's that when it is, does not appear possible, that's simply a matter that analysis and disassembly has yet to reach a point where it could have confidence streamlining it. And to roll into maybe my example, um, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, when we talk about how everything's become an RPG, um, you know, back in the day, there used to be games that were just an RPG, and that was totally fine. Um, and then over time, right, as that genre became well understood, which, by the way, I think we can translate in today's language as simply a system of progression, um, but that that system of progression now is well understood enough that it can be basically broken down. It's like we've, you know, discovered new algebra techniques and we can now distill progression techniques into smaller pieces, small enough that they could be added to another project, right? Because at a certain point in the past, if I was going to make an RPG, it's going to take all my effort to make an RPG. So I can't have it be an RPG that also has, you know, running around and shooting things like it's uh, Duke Nukem or something. <laughs> Another piece of this puzzle, by the way, I think, or at least one we're starting to see emerge, is idle games. That there was a game called Cookie Clicker. But as time moves on, especially in the mobile space, idle mechanics is becoming a more and more commonly used term. And, and the idle games are getting more complex. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least the, the ones that, are, that, that, are, that focus on idle mechanics are becoming almost sprawling. Mm-hmm. Um, there's that one that I was telling Tomo about, a Loop Odyssey. Which is an idle puzzle game where you're trying to not only uh, level things up by repeating, but you're also trying to figure out like the best routes to design to like hit everything on the map. And yeah, Odyssey is, is good. Uh, the girl was uh, on Reddit for for a while uh, promoting the game, trying to get people involved in it. I mean, it's definitely heavily influenced by Loop Hero, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but it's a lot of it's a lot of fun trying to optimize that uh, system. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it sounds like Loop Hero. Yeah, it it's appears on the surface so similar, especially in sort of its art presentation, that I thought it was just the Loop Hero people exposing their tool set. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a blatant ripoff and was like, "Oh, come on!" But no, it's it's solid. No, and the idea itself, that's a big difference, right? That's like a fundamentally different ex uh, experience. Yeah, and one of our topics we had like pinned for another round table was to talk about marketing and kind of promoting yourself. And I think that will definitely come up there. Maybe as a both a positive and a negative example, considering how much it looks like Loop Hero. Um, I guess my example would definitely be the integration of roguelike and roguelite design into a lot of different aspects. This was something that I talked about in my book on roguelike design and how for a lot of people their only exposure to roguelikes would be something like a Spelunky or that game Returnal that came out last year or even something like Hades uh, uh, by M. Isaac but the genre is still going on in its original form. There's stuff like uh, Caves of Quid uh, there was that game that I played, I think, last week or the week before. That was kind of like a space marine. You're fighting demons, but it's all turn-based. Jupiter Hell. What was that? Jupiter Hell. Oh, yeah, there's another one out now that's also doing that. <laughs> with a very it used to be called Doom Roguelike, mm -hmm. but uh, they had to separate from the Doom name. Mm -hmm. I like Jupiter Hell, although it's, it's partly because I like the developer. <laughs> Yeah, and like the funny thing for me is that I am not a huge traditional roguelike fan. Like the one, the only one that I kind of enjoyed was a Dungeons of Dreadmore back in the day. And a big thing for me was both kind of like the slowness of those games and the complexity and kind of like the amount of time you need to spend playing with them. Those are kind of like the factors that stop me from really enjoying a lot of the older roguelikes. So when a lot of developers really began to streamline these systems and integrate them into other genres, they basically, like my thumbnail demonstrates, they trim the fat of those games. So now I can play a game like Buying of Isaac in 30 to 45 minutes. I can do an hour of Slay the Spire or Dead Cells. And 
I'm getting a lot of that same flavor of the roguelikes, but without those elements that would either annoy me or just make me stop playing those games previously. There's a, a, a really good roguelike that's kind of roguelite-ish called Desktop Dungeons. Mm. And while it looks simple on the surface, it's actually got a really interesting element that kind of becomes a puzzle element of how you conquer the level. The design is really streamlined. Oh, yeah, Streamlined, sorry. <laughs> uh, in fact, so much so, I might, I might call it a puzzle game first. Yeah, I really? I mean, it's, 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 it's procedural generation. Uh, yeah, but there's, uh, but there's definitely, uh, there are rules to what the optimal solutions are. That's true. That's true. And it is. It's limited, right? It's the skin. It, in, in so many ways, it's a puzzle game um, uh, with the clothing of, of, of rogue or hack. And then with some additional stuff added in there to kind of keep you reanalyzing. It's, uh, in fact, it, in, you know, in a weird sort of way, it's let's say we took the DNA of, of Minesweeper, right? <laughs> <laughs> and combined it, <laughs> combined it with some other genres to get, it, uh, to there... get uh, Desktop Dungeons, which, by the way, I love. Yeah, I'm horrible at the game, but I love it too. And there is actually a Minesweeper meets roguelike game that I played like a few years ago, whose name completely escapes me. Um, I would also add something like the uh, Shirin the Wanderer series, for anyone who's a fan of them, as another example of kind of trimming out some of the roguelike elements. That one is more of a story-driven roguelike, but it hits, again, a lot of the same cues and elements of a traditional one. But I guess uh, for you, Rami, do you have any examples of games from some of the ones that you've played that have been more streamlined? Well, I mean, I was just going to say, I, I'm operating in the, in the games as a service space. Mm -hmm. And and the biggest problem that in the space that, that, that touches on this is, is that developers often don't know what they're making until they've made it. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, uh, look what we made. And then they're like, okay, this isn't working, and that isn't working, and this isn't working. And, and it's, like, it's almost like most of the development occurs after the release of the product because they really didn't think it through that well initially. And they have to, and as games as a service, as soon as players get bored of whatever they have, they have to keep adding stuff onto it, and it just becomes a, a Frankenstein monster. So they, I think uh, in, in our space, we need to um, you know, plan for success, uh, make your... your, your even though the game may be extremely complex in your end, you've got to make it as simple as possible on the, on the side for the, of the, the consumer. So they again say, oh yeah, I've played this before, I know what this is like, but maybe because it's games as a service, there's 100 times more content than I'm used to, but the, right, the actual foundations of the game are, are familiar and, and simple enough that they can, they can just jump into initially. Mm -hmm. Isn't the, the idol, um, AFK, gotcha, isn't that pretty much MMOs uh, taken taken to a, a really distilled level? No, it's not. I think if you think about all the people who run bots in a World of Warcraft <laughs> raids because they can't actually be bothered to sit down for eight hours and you know have their eyes melt while they're trying to fight some dragon, then yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, some, some, someone even made a game like that where you you run a you run a a, a party um, that they're all botting and they're trying to. To defeat these monsters, <laughs> I'm playing a okay. very strange idle game uh, where I think the context of the game was that you were managing a raid. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I think we're thinking about yeah. the same game. There's um, a raid okay. manager. Uh, there's one where you're a healer, and the characters can can rage quit. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, no, no, I, yeah, yeah. I was it, definitely thinking of the same game. I, very I it was interesting brilliant. idea. <laughs> I thought it was a brilliant idea for a game. Oh, I love I love the idea. I've actually got one of them on my iPad. I want to look up what it is real quick. And the healer one's called Raid Healer, right? Or something yeah. like that? Yeah. And that's a great idea. I mean, these there are these patterns that humans have gotten into that are modern. And depicting them is not just okay. It's fascinating. And it's sort of obvious in hindsight. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's a really good point there, especially about this topic is how a lot of the streamlining, a lot of this like cutting away of these elements really does like, it gives you that, that kind of, you know, why anyone else think of this moment? 
with a lot of these games. Like, Slay the Spire. Again, like, Slay the Spire was originally uh, inspired by, I think, what was it? Uh, Rogue Quest? Dream. Dream Quest. Dream Quest, thank you. And, like, the idea of what if we put cards into a roguelike? What if we make deck building more than just collecting cards? Let's make it a part of an interesting combat system. And the genre has blown up huge because of it. And it's that case of just, like, figuring out where do you want to focus? I think there's something that... I think the Tomo, I didn't. I think we had this conversation about like, where do you? Fo- I, all I remember when we had our discussion on Jank about like, where do you focus the complexity? Where do you focus the depth of this game on? And that's very important because one of the things that I think we see from games that tend to fail these lessons is when they just try to throw everything in. And it's something that we could definitely say of a lot of games that try to be, you know, it's a full-on action game, but it's also a full-on RPG, and when you start mixing very different genres like that, you always run that risk of alienating both groups. And it's why you have to be, I think, very careful in terms of what aspects you're trying to, I guess, distill from one genre or one system to the other. And hopefully you've, you've analyzed the marketplace and mm-hmm. you have some confidence in your theory that there are human beings that want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. You don't want to make a game thing and have no idea if anyone will actually play it. Some games we only make for ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you just take the hardest parts of all the genres and combine them into, into one, one, one <laughs> monstrous game. I'm sure there's a developer doing just that right now. I've, I'm, well, I'm the speedrunners sure. might eat that up. Well, you know, 2006 MMO design was was getting to that point <laughs> where you just throw everything at the wall and, and, you know, make it so that you have to be online 24 hours a day. I think that the game I was thinking of might be uh, called It's a Wipe. Yes, It's a wipe. a wipe. That's such a uh, great name for it, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to sit here and plug a specific game, but it's a, you know, it's a little indie project, but um, it's fun if you're if you've ever been one of those people who's had, had, who's you know been in a WoW raid for hours and hours and hours. You, mm-hmm. You'll find this extremely amusing. I last Agrippa played it. Uh, seems to uh, uh, not like the job simulator games, <laughs> <laughs> which is streamlining. I mean, they are pretty streamlined. You know, working a gas station it's, it's not that complex. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, what's interesting about those kinds of games, though, is I feel like they fit inside the category, the same category that um, sort of the, the, the recent or recent-ish um, interest in adult coloring books, right? Mm. There's a certain sort of yeah. meditative, non-complex, low uncertainty to the experience um, that those games offer. And when people want that, that it's really exactly what they need. But mm. that if, if what you want is, you know, to play Dominions 5 multiplayer <laughs> and explore all these complicated systems and how impossible they are, then, yeah, it's kind of the opposite of what you're looking for. Yeah, and I think that's a very interesting, like, uh, contrast to some of the other examples of this. When we see genres that have been taking other systems, again, like the impl- implementation of roguelike or even ARPG elements, and trying to add depth where there wasn't any before um we can look at racing games as a really good example if we talk about kind of like early generation racing games it was pick a car drive down the road whoever crosses the finish line wins and the cars are very much fixed in that respect and then over the last five to ten years we've seen not only open world elements with i think was it forza and i think there's a few other ones the entire you know car modification and customization aspect and they're trying to really turn these games into, you know, full on, you know, this is going to be your everyday game. And we could certainly say the same thing for a Call of Duty and even just any live service or a games as a service game about adding in those little elements. And a lot of them, again, going back to the original point, have been RPG systems and mechanics to instill that greater sense of progression. 
You know, what about when you combine it into a uh, management game, like the uh, uh, the motorsports manager stuff? And that's some some really some really interesting systems going on behind the scenes with with something like that. Although I don't know if I would call it simplified. It's interesting, <laughs> but and uh, uh, you know, obviously you have all the football manager sims, which I could never figure out what the <laughs> heck's going on and why my team can't score, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, getting getting those management style games. That's because you're a war gamer and you want to be able to see all the options. You have the best strategy. Uh, yeah. But they don't tell you the hidden stats, and it all screws you up. Football manager. You know, I want to know what like to train. <laughs> <laughs> what were uh, you going to say? Um, yeah. You started to say something, Rami. Oh, uh, I was just going to say that you know, games as a service is, can be if you can get somebody to. You know, uh, for that game to be your your daily thing, then there's a lot of money to be made, which is why developers want to be able to do that. It's not maybe as easy to accomplish as they're they're hoping, so it doesn't usually work out like they intended. But if you can pull it off, it it, it can be fantastic. I mean, like like a world of tanks or world of warships, people have been playing those games for every day for five, six, seven years. Yeah, I mean, I haven't played World of Warcraft in a while, but I did play it for. I mean, I still. I still can play it, and that's like what, like fifteen years now. And yeah. I have good solid. I think I, I was I was in the last year of the World of Tanks beta, and I, you know mm. I, I I I come back online uh, for their Christmas specials. Mm. You know that said though, uh, I think what you bring up is really interesting. This idea that live service is kind of an extremely high difficulty environment to be successful, mm. and well, I just got some loud sounds. Um, and uh, I think. <laughs> Something essential that we're, to what we're talking about here is designers of today have mastered certain types of interactive rule sets. So the, I, the basic ideas of an RPG are no longer like the kind of material that many of, especially like mobile games, mm -hmm. live service designers would consider to, to wrap a whole game around. Rather, they've broken that into a million pieces and thrown that into their toolbox, as well as a number of other, uh, many, many other tools. And now they're trying to sculpt an experience fitting within a theme with some mm -hmm. expectation or some actual measured data from a user base. And they're, they're, they're crafting a tunnel with rooms and places to stay. And they're trying to, and I'm, I'm sure this is an okay description of what Ramin is thinking along to build this pathway into the future that extends forever. And it's just, a, it's just a really tall order. To go back and then recreate wizardry now would be fairly trivial. To go and take away all our knowledge and have us build wizardry, totally different game. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's... so glad that we don't have to map with graph paper and RPGs <laughs> anymore. Oh, yes. Yes. But you say that, but what if you made a game that's about mapping with graph paper? <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw the game of Dungeon Encounters on Steam. Uh, it's like a Square Enix, like, it's the most streamlined dungeon crawl. I mean, it's literally just you looking at, like, a giant graph of tiles. There's, like, no art to this game other than, like, character images. Like, I, I don't know how they got away with it other than the fact that it's coming from Square Enix. Wow, and they well, want, I mean, like, $26 for this. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. It's got good reviews. I gotta tell you, I like what I'm seeing. I mean, it, it, it's the game if you if you love dungeon crawling RPGs and nothing else, it is a really great game. But if you expect any other affordance or aesthetics or mechanics, no. Like it is for one kind of person. I think that's it. <laughs> but so one of the one of the devs that that hangs out uh, in the TSI Discord, Emperor. Um, has done some really streamlined stuff. He took uh, tower defense and uh, uh, stripped it down of all the flash and everything. And it's just very, very solid and simple tower defense, and it's a great game. And now he's doing it with ARPGs. Um, mm. Basically, it's a loot generator. So you're, 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 killing, you're killing things in a turn-based manner, and you're collecting the loot, but it's it's done on a, a five by five grid or a ten by ten grid. It's it's randomly generated. Um, there's no story. It's just get your loot, get out, <laughs> keep going. 
it's and those streamlined games are really really good when you don't want to just dive into something that takes six hours to learn as i get older i find it harder to play complex deep games i hear that, you no and and you know one of the things that i well, if I think about that that sentiment, which which I do share, at least part of my thought process shares that, is in order to play those complex games, you need to set aside the time mm -hmm. to accommodate all the new lessons that you need to understand in order to just to play. And so, like I, you know, I think about the time it took me to get to the beginning of my first playthrough of Crusader Kings, or for Hearts of Iron. You know, and and that that amount of time was much larger than, for example, the amount of time it took to get through my first to start and then finish my first playthrough of something like Stellaris. And that there's really sometimes like there is something satisfying about a complex rule set. It's just that we got we were able to make giant piles of complex rule set well before we were able to explain how they all fit together elegantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. I think I'm with you guys on that as well, just because, again, there are, you know, 200% more games being released now. That's a, a scientific percentage, I'm just throwing that out there, than there were 15, 20 years ago. And it's hard to keep up when you have 20 or 30 games being released daily. And if that one game can kind of just, like, perfectly fit into your schedule or fit into your mentality, you'll play that for... 50, 100, 500 hours, like it's nothing. Um, Gunfire Reborn has taken over our multiplayer nights because it's one of those games that just, it perfectly hits those, you know, checkboxes that it's meaning to do. And to something that uh, Tomo said a few minutes ago about how a lot of developers are really growing up with kind of that knowledge of these individual mechanics and systems to then break them up. I mean, that describes so many indie games these days of developers wanting to take something that they really like and say, you know, I really like RPG leveling, but I hate grinding. What if I put into a cooking game or a visual novel game or a platformer? And suddenly we see these games that are just these hybrids or hodgepodges of different mechanics, and they're just taking enough for you to get that taste without, you know, taking all the baggage that comes with them. I feel like a bad gamer because I keep going back to these idle gotcha games because I don't have to think and they're quick to get into and I know the loops. Um, you know, it's, it's much easier than, than sitting down and trying to get a Crusader game, uh, game going on in, in my head because it's going to take hours and hours and hours. Uh, there, there is a problem with the way the world works. At least you, you don't have to see it as a problem, but... Once you are given the same thing for faster and cheaper, it sure is harder to spend more for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I once had an NPR interview where the, the, the lady interviewing me asked me, uh, said, you know, I, I told her, I, you, know, you can make a game out of anything. She says, anything? And I'm like, yeah, anything. Mm -hmm. And she's like, how about making toast? And I'm like, oh yeah. So yeah. I start explaining all the things you could do to, to make a <laughs> making toast into a into a game, any games with the progression system and RPG elements, and and she's like, he's serious. Yeah. She's yeah. laughing, but but uh, pretty soon she could see it could actually be a game. I'm already thinking of like if you, if you find her again, you should send her a copy of I Am Bread. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already thinking of a like toast-based mechanics in my head right now. I'm already thinking of the toast systems. <laughs> 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 and yeah, yeah, I think the level of inf the level of investment in these older titles and what we're seeing today is a really good I think juxtaposition between. You know, what people want today. Like, you can have, and this is something I say a lot, that depth and complexity are not always equal. There are a lot of complicated games out there, but they're really only, you know, total level deep once you kind of figure out those systems. And, again, like, going back to my roguelike, roguelite example, that the reason why I've been so drawn to kind of the action roguelikes and the deck builders is that they're not that complicated to play. But there's depth in terms of figuring out those systems. 
And when you have that, it makes it a lot easier to kind of get get somebody's foot in the door. And I think this is something that I'm sure, uh, Ramin, you thought of a lot with live service, something that I've seen with a lot of the mobile games, that they're designed to be as non-threatening as possible. They want to make it like, you know, you're laying on a nice fluffy pil pillow and relaxing when you're playing these games. Because they know that if they try to hit you over the head with everything from minute one, most people are going to just turn tail. They're not going to think, I don't want to, you know, play a game that has like 90 hours of mechanics and systems. I just want to watch a little guy, you know, run across the screen. Or I want to watch, you know, money drop into a piggy bank. <laughs> what was that yeah, I... uh, one game that came out a couple of years ago, Progress Quest? Mm -hmm. You just basically... You know, it just basically bars moving across the street. <laughs> Progress Quest is is like um, nine ish or so, maybe nine or ten years old. Mm. It's true. And it's, that's true. And it and it's full autoplay, right? You generate a character, and that's it. Yeah. Time, time to watch forever. <laughs> yeah. But you yeah, get I mean, that sense of progression. <laughs> Those dopamine hits that he <laughs> talks about so much. Yeah, Go. Two really key elements if you're gonna games as a service and be successful at is, is one it's got to be e easy to play and have another thing is it has to have a, a huge depth of content to keep the player engaged so they don't feel like they're just grinding or or you know getting doing repetitive activity like uh, you know as seth pointed out you know i like to talk about dopamine you know dopamine mm -hmm. uh can actually flip and go negative on you if, if you're uh dopamine is released when you have an experience that's 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 new that you haven't done before mm -hmm. Or at least the optimum amount is released uh, when it's new. You haven't done it before, and there's a significant chance of failure. Uh, but if you keep doing something over and over again, the chance of failure disappears because you figure out how to do it perfectly every time. And mm -hmm. and it's not the first time, so you don't get this like uh, this excitement for you know that's that's there to like it's biology's way of training you to 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 be adventurous and try new things and, and to overcome adversity and. Uh, uh, so, so getting that just right is 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 really hard. And I, I came to the conclusion back in 2012 that uh, to have, make the games with the amount of complexity and depth that I wanted, but to have them be manageable for player, I'd have to start using auto battlers. So I've, I've started been designing games for not you know a lot of them haven't gone to market yet, but I've been d designing games. Seth, Seth, what are you doing back there? <laughs> what what's happening? I can't I can't hear myself. There's like a wind tunnel going on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I, I've made some games that haven't gone to market, but, but use auto ballers. And then the game I'm making now is pro possibly the world's most complex game ever, Project mm -hmm. Loon. But it, it starts you off with, uh, you, you eventually you're going to be playing with 40 players on 40 player battles. Each player bringing in multiple creatures. The creatures can range from size 1 to 100,000, all on the same map. Uh, so just crazy scale differences. It's it's going to be complete mayhem, which I think I I think people will enjoy. But but it's going to be a auto battler. So you place your troops and then sit back, and everyone on your team, which could be up to forty players, just sits back and watches the show. And I I think you can see a lot of players are actually moving towards that. If games are are like too complex for them to figure out, or would take too much time for them to figure out, but they still want to experience it because it looks cool, they just go on YouTube and they just watch other people play it. Uh, sometimes they, they spend more time watching people play games than actually playing games themselves. It's like the new thing. And, and I think that's why the, the idol genre has become appealing. Yeah. No, and, and I think that we have an old-fashioned mistake of sentiment, old game designers, that somehow hitting the button yourself is fundamentally different. But I don't think it is. I think all that matters is if the same thing's going on up here, then that's mm -hmm. the actual, that's the real uh, business end of gameplay. Yeah, and I think that could definitely lead into a topic talking about streamer and watching culture when it comes to video games today compared, again, to 20, 30 years ago. And why we have seen a lot of developers go for what's kind of, you know, quote-unquote stream-friendly games. Games that you can, you know, show off to people easily, whether it's because of, you know, not messing up with uh, streaming software or just having modes and options so that other people can join and watch. We've seen this with the fighting genre and even with strategy games. I know uh, StarCraft 2 had, what was it, uh, the Blizzcast or they had like some kind of like a uh, match, no, not matchmaking, uh, commentator mode that you could play and watch other people's matches. 
And there's, I mean, to Amin's point about, like, getting, like, dopamine hits, like, I've watched my fair share of people who do gotcha openings and video games, and they get, like, dozens if not hundreds of people watching them, just watching, you know, them opening up these loot boxes or watching the banner roll and hoping they get that six-star character, and then people even, it becomes an almost a communal aspect of, you know, oh, I got this character in 10 pools. Oh, I spent $500 and got nothing. And there is that kind of shared experience that you get with these simple mechanics that you wouldn't be able to get this if, let's say, we were playing an XCOM or we were playing a Europa Universalis kind of game, that you wouldn't be able to get that kind of shared experience of watching and experiencing it. I, I spent some time watching my godson from maybe like age six, watching him watch game videos. He, he wasn't very good at actually playing games. His hand-eye coordination wasn't very good, and he just didn't, his brain wasn't wired for that yet. But uh, he would just love to spend hours and hours watching other people play games. And he'd get really excited. I mean, I'd be watching him, and his hands would be getting like this, and he's like jumping in around, and he's like, he's, he's totally getting into it. He's totally immersed. And uh, it's just amazing to watch that. Uh, and, and, and after a year or two, I could have a conversation with him, and he'd talk back to me like he was like Joe Pro Gamer. And I was like, how did you learn all this stuff? <laughs> well, I mean, he was learning it at a high rate by just absorbing it through all these YouTube channels. So, uh, so by age eight, he's like hardcore gamer, and he's mm -hmm. hardly even played any games. Yeah. Not a surprise, right? It's like what... It the kids always want to know what, uh, what everyone's talking about and they listen really closely. And mm -hmm. sometimes that fresh view gives you insights that just are difficult for those of us that, it, that were there. It's like the, the matrix. Past. <laughs> it's like the matrix. Why, why learn something? We can just download it. Can I uh, download how to play your bully universalis? So well, how big is that down? Right. Going to be? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, you have to just watch a bunch of YouTube videos for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, am I still in a wind tunnel? No, you're no, good now. Great. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, there's two points I want to bring up for this topic in terms of streamlining mechanics and systems. I will get everyone's thoughts on. So, the first one is, of course, the little indie hit. This is one of the games I think. Uh, Tom and I, we may have to cover with the being covering, that's Vampire Survivors. We, of course, said Heroes Hour last month, but Vampire Survivors kind of blew up in a way that a lot of people were not, I'm sure the developer wasn't expecting it as well. And it is very much like the quintessential example of what we're talking about. It is a light bullet hell slash idol slash progression, just like box of dopamine that you can play for 30 minute stretches and you get experience. For some people out there, it's as exciting as watching paint drying. For other people, it's like that perfect, you know, almost like a perfect like 30 minute meal that you can enjoy and then come back to whenever you want. Although, you know, if they're watching paint drying that frenetically, there's something <laughs> weird going on. I think there is a paint drawing idol game out there. I'm for, I think oh, I've heard I, of it. It has to be. I mean, we have leaf blowing. We have power washing. No, and, and honestly, I think we'll see more and more of it as time goes on. Like mm -hmm. this idea that you're going to clean the the disruption of a surface until it's smooth. Like that is, that's that's deeply satisfying. That power wash simulator. Like I was watching a YouTuber play. Like I have no interest in, but like. Damn, you know, he is cleaning that house up really nicely. It does look a lot better now. <laughs> <laughs> or what well, was that, uh, that Starship Janitor game? Yeah. I don't remember the name of it. You'd be, you'd be cleaning clean up, up after... Yeah, yeah it was like, the, like aliens would come in and have a battle, and there'd be human parts and alien parts all over the place, and you'd be the one who has to come in and clean up afterwards. <laughs> I think it was Viscera Cleanup Detail or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. The word Viscera was in it. <laughs> <laughs> and yet people oh, you, you, again you never know what is going to resonate with people and when it does blow up like that it does i think change the question as to what does the market really want 
And like Vampire Survivors, again, I think going back to what I was saying with Indies, is a perfect example of a game that it would have never, I think, been conceived by a major studio at all. Like no one at a company wanting to invest millions of dollars in a game would ever have thought to make a game like that. But making something so small and so compact, it really lets those systems, you know, speak for themselves. Some um, Forager would probably be another example of this. That game that yeah. it started out as a game jam. I, I'm not sure if it won the game jam, but it came close. And they turned it into a full game, and it's a really great game. Is it the deepest game? No. But it's just that deep enough to, you Specifically. know... Specifically. Exactly. Not the deepest game, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some of these indie darlings, you know, they just get... Uh, there's a lot of luck involved mm-hmm. with... Uh, um, Among Us failed. It was a failed game. Yeah. And it was a combination of going on sales, sale for 99 cents and being picked up by, by the streamers mm-hmm. that blew it up into... Yeah, that- Something it would have never become on its own. And I think the pandemic sort of contributed to it as well. Oh, certainly, certainly. And Which I game? think to some degree there are some streamers among us. out there. What? Uh, Rami was asking what game it was. It was Among Us. Uh-oh. Yeah. There's some streamers out there that are almost the bellwether of whether this is going to happen. Um, Northern Lion, if it's a roguelike mm-hmm. and he's playing it, it's going to blow up. And um, Markiplier with a lot of the horror games. Uh, yep. Mainly Badass Heroes, another one. Yep, and like again, like this again goes back to what I was saying with like kind of stream friendly or YouTube friendly games these days. That if you can get your game into the hands of someone who has a lot of clout or a lot of people who follow them, in some cases it does end up becoming the marketing unto itself. But just as we've said that, there are games that have certainly backfired. Like, we've seen some developers say, oh, you know, my game was picked up by Markiplier or PewDiePie, and that translates to, like, no sales or almost negligible, negligible amount of it. And like Seth was saying, like, you just never really know which games are going to, you know, hit that, you know, the collective unconscious of what people are looking for. Yep, um, yeah, Flappy uh, Bird, another good example. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, there, there are so many on mobile that, that were just like, how did this become, become a big thing? And there, there's a lot of luck in indie development. I mean, sometimes you see games sure. that are really good mm-hmm. that don't make it. Oh, yes. And sometimes you see crap that just explodes. But- I thought, uh, what was that one where Fall Guys... <laughs> I thought that was garbage. Did you just say crap that explodes? Yeah. <laughs> hey. <Little image. laughs> just a part of life, at least creating new life. Mm. Uh, yeah, to a thousand moons comedy, yeah. Like, I wasn't a huge fan of Among Us myself, and yeah, it did kind of start as, like, a town of Sailor and the whole uh, social dedu- deduction genre. And it never really interests me. Again, I'm more of a single-player kind of guy. But, again, like that kind of lies in the point that for games that are more single-player, more complicated to play, they're not the best streaming games. It's hard to watch. It's hard to make something like streaming Europa Universalis or streaming Total War or, you know, pick any single-player, very complicated game Making that as exciting as watching somebody play a Five Nights at Freddy's or a PUBG or Among Us. I don't know. I you know because of my background, I'd rather watch a CK3 stream. But the streamer's got to be good, or the YouTuber's mm-hmm. got to be entertaining, or it's it's like watching paint dry. Yeah. Well, you know, I think if, if you've ever tried to get a group of your friends to play a game and that they all had different kind of interests in what they what they play on their own. Um, there's a ton of friction to get, let's say, four people together to mm-hmm. play a new game. And very few games in the course of our history was actually very amenable to that process. And Among Us is one of those games. You could literally, you could be on the phone with people and go, download this game, get it installed, load it up, here's the info, here we go, and you're in. 
And you might not have any idea what you're doing, but over the course of literally 15 minutes, you can actually get a similar experience to what you see on that stream, which cannot be said for most games, yeah. right? In fact, it, it might be fair to say it cannot be said of almost all games. I would also throw like some like tabletop simulator in this conversation. The idea the that... Reason? What was that? Just a funny game. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that... If you were to try and do a lot of these games on your own, you would need to set up times, places, you know, the space to play these games. With Tabletop Simulator, you start a server, you pick a game, invite your friends in, you're done. And, like, that, like, for me, like, that's been my only real exposure to Tabletop games. Because I did not have the space or the people locally to play those games growing up. So this was a huge way for me to experience these games, and we could e easily say the same thing for, again, like deck builders going online, like Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, was it, uh, Gwent, and so on. That when you remove those barriers of entry and those pain points, and you're just left with, you know, the distilled elements of these mechanics and systems, you can attract a far wider audience than you would have otherwise. I, I remember when I was younger going to these conventions for, you know, role-playing conventions or, or whatever, game conventions, and, and there'd always be a room for the tabletop Warhammer guys. And they'd mm -hmm. have these huge mm -hmm. tables that would just have, like, thousands of these miniatures. And you know these guys have been, it, it been painted, each one of these. I mean, they, they've just literally got years spent just developing this army that they've got on the table. And, and... <laughs> It takes them like three day convention just to do a few moves of their army versus the other army, and and and, and it happens so slowly that you probably wouldn't even realize that things are moving uh, if you were watching it. Uh, but I just it was the idea that you could have two huge armies like that battling it out and watch it to me would would seem really exciting. Uh, it's just it's just impractical the amount of you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars you have to spend to, to have all those miniatures and then that huge table and <laughs> the amount of time it would take and, and, and all that stuff. So that's part, part was my, part of my inspiration with Project Loon where you could have hundreds of, of units on both sides and they'd be battling out, but you could just watch it and you can watch it anytime you want because the, 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 the battles would be stored for 24 hours. So you could just go back and check it later and see how it turned out. And you're doing it with your friends so that you get that kind of effect where where Tom was talking about, where you can just jump right in and play with your friends, which I think is kind of missing, and, we, and, and it's really a, it, there's a strong consumer demand for that. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's I, a testament to how hard it is, because yeah. otherwise there'd be more of it. Because it's always profitable, it seems. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, once a, once a few companies nail it, they'll get copied. Castle <laughs> Crashers, that's another great example, by the way. Oh, yeah. I have seen <laughs> so many different groups of friends that my kids know, and the only game they were able to get off the ground was Castle Crashers. <laughs> Castle Crashers is outstanding. And it's actually fundamentally more like this thing that we're talking about than any of um, uh, their, their games. Uh, Behemoths. Is that mm -hmm. what they're called? Behemoth? The Behemoth, Behemoth I think? Yeah. Yeah. Which, and all their games are outstanding. Mm -hmm. But Castle Crashers stands out as somewhat more magical. Mm -hmm. I know they're working on a new Alien Hominid game that I'm excited for. I'm excited about that too, Dan. <laughs> As a time check, it's a little after 8 ET. I know uh, you guys say you probably go in like the next 10 to 15 minutes. So yeah. we'll, I have one final question. And for chat, if you have any comments or anything you want us to talk about really fast, please get them in now. This will be a last call for them. But the other game that I want to bring up in terms of streamlining and simplifying and this may be one of the games that Tom and I will have to talk about on one of our Game of the Month cast. But of course, the hot game right now is Elden Ring. And there are, I'm sure there are developers and companies scrambling to try and figure out how to emulate from software success. I saw a report earlier today saying that it is going, it is probably on track to be from software's best selling game of all time. And I think it has already cleared the amount of money Dark Souls 3 brought in. And that was like over its lifetime projections. And the thing that everyone keeps returning to with Elden Ring is the streamlining. This idea of removing and cutting out a lot of the flack or a lot of the fat of open world games. There's far fewer things to do in this world. It is not as, you know, 
time absorbing as something like Dying Light or Horizon was going to be. And the question I think a lot of people want to know is did Elden Ring, you know, you know, hit strike that magical target that is working? Is it some kind of secret sauce of that game? But is are there any I think lessons I think people want to glean from Elden Ring kind of being more of an older throwback, but almost with like a different face or a different mask? So to break that silence, <laughs> I, I still need to play Elden Ring. It might be the first kind of mainstream game that I spend more than 30 bucks on and actually play. I have a long, old history of loving those kinds of games, or at least the maybe the genetic ancestors of those games, because it's not like um, <laughs> Dark Souls has been around forever, but um, still. <laughs> Yeah, the science for me is, is I haven't played it, and I, I tend to gravitate towards uh, mathematically complex games. The more complex, the better. And, uh, you know, so, so just visual types of games, usually not the type of things I play. Plus, my, my laptop would probably melt. <laughs> Your laptop would melt with Elden Ring. <laughs> now, I've, I've heard not necessarily great things about Elden Ring. There are definitely some issues with it. Mm -hmm. It's not you know, it's not the second coming at all. But the hype meter was so high on it, it was guaranteed to succeed and massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, people people were just like drooling over over getting it. And you know, if they had delayed it, uh, there would <laughs> probably be riots. <laughs> I saw a a three minute commercial for Elden Ring that's running in Asia that is just absolutely insane. You don't know it's for Elden Ring until like the last mm. 15 seconds. Uh, Amazing. The marketing behind it is, is, is dramatic. Now, the gameplay is definitely streamlined from, from PromSoft to other stuff. And I think that's also giving it some, some negative press as well as, as positive. Uh, definitely like when a game blows like that, you'll have people you know, jump at the bit to either declare the best game of all time or it's the worst game of all time. You know, Elden Ring is secretly overrated. No, it's secretly the best game. <laughs> all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chris brought up a really good point that I forgot that I think is also a very big thing for the specific topic, and that's the concept of the mom test. And this was something that, um, what was his name? George Fan of PopCap Games in his famous GC talk was discussing how he created plants versus zombies. And those will be my final point, because I don't care, we'll be here for another four hours. But <laughs> his GDC talk is one of my favorites. And a lot of it was how he made a tower defense game so simple that his mother, who never played video games, could figure it out. And I was there at that panel live watching that. And it's fascinating to see that level of iteration over the course of how many prototypes they had to get the game to that level. And it does, and this is something I always say, that it is very hard to make simple games. Because you would think that something like a Plants vs. Zombies or a Super Meat Boy or anything else like this would be a simple, it would be easy to develop. But a lot of that complexity, you're, you as a developer have to kind of shoulder that burden in order to make it more appealing to people. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest challenge in game development is to make the game very simple on the side of the, the, the user, but, but potentially very complex on your side. But you have, to, you have to shoulder that burden, as you said, where you have to do all that complexity mm -hmm. so that the player doesn't have to. Just like I don't want to have to learn how to do a, a Warhammer 40k tabletop battle. That, mm -hmm. that would just be That would be an occupation. <laughs> uh, but I'd still I'd like to experience it. Yep. It's a fun occupation. I, I, I used to have an <laughs> occupation. <laughs> I would not play a lot of of certain games like Warhammer or Sea Creek, uh, you know, some of the some of the bigger miniature style games unless they came to computer. And uh, I think that streamlines the process of playing the game. Yeah. Um a great deal. 
There is one genre that I'm surprised no one has brought up yet, but the rise of CRPGs. The original RPGs, the Might and Magics, the Baldur's Gates, that were very much tabletop role-playing games where the computer is the dungeon master. So suddenly you don't need to worry about learning rules and reading the manual. The AI or the game engine does it all for you. Oh man, and um, uh, Neverwinter Nights is the is the first golden <laughs> age of that. Yeah. <laughs> all the old uh, gold, uh, gold box games, Pool of Radiance and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the original SSI D&D games, they're being released on Steam uh, next week. I saw that oh, wow. straight crack back when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's like my anything. entire childhood. Trying to get Fireball and Lightning Bolt. Yeah, <laughs> baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, Only, like... Oh, go ahead, Tomo. No, I was just going to say for, for the 40-foot radius of, of fireballs being mob depicted in, <laughs> in those games. And mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I hit everybody. All my guys, too. <laughs> yeah. And you could bounce Lightning Bolts off the wall, right? It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it was as if the people that made the game had played Dungeons and Dragons. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, to uh, I think what Seth was saying about a minute ago about, you know, being able to experience tabletop games on the PC. Like for me, a lot of those older RPGs, and I've said this before, like I just bounce right off of them because I never grew up playing them. So going back to those games and like kind of dealing with all the complexities that were inherent of that, it just doesn't interest me. It's much like the first and early generations of roguelikes. And yeah, but you don't get to choose that, Josh. Yeah. You're a historian, so you know that's that that's that's part of your life mission. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be forced to play those. Games. I still ever want to play a thief and a, what was it? And Hitman too. I have to do. And yeah, it's going. Cool. <laughs> Go ahead. If, if, you, if you want some suggestions from the old farts, we're here. We're happy to help. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, the SSI games coming, I'll uh, let you guys uh, <laughs> pick the games for me to try from that. <laughs> Man, like SSI. <laughs> it's so crazy. I, I, I'll definitely buy those quickly. But SSI is definitely one of the most important pieces of my sort of like important origin story DNA in terms of play experience. Yeah, yeah. Across the board, Absolutely. all the SSI games, like so much ranging from Dungeons and Dragons to, you know, Panzers rolling across fields. <laughs> One of my favorite old games from that was like Sword of Aragon, I think it was called, where you could play a uh, like a cavalry commander or a knight or like a barbarian or, or something like that. And, and, and it plays completely differently depending on, on which, which one you take because you have access to like different units. And I don't know if, 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 if if they would release something like that, I would totally go back and play that. <laughs> and, and it will. Uh, uh, and no, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, and since we are going to be wrapping things up in the next few minutes, I guess, like, the point I want to throw out is that I always wonder, like, what will be the next streamlined game? Like, who's going to crack the next code? You know, who will be the vampire survivors of platforming or of, you know, a grand strategy game? Um,. I saw the I played a demo for Ozymandias, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. From the festival. And like that is a really interesting game. It is it's described, you know, like the pint size four X grand strategy game. And I was getting into it by the end of that demo. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think we see some prototypical um grand strategy like features appearing in the odd game here and there. It's not it's not broadly known because probably because so few people like to play grand strategy to its to its real depths but um i think well what were you going to say seth before i say what i think the next compression will be no no go ahead go ahead i, I was just going to say from a mm -hmm. from a um from a genre standpoint i think it is the disassembly and fractionalization of not to be confused with the nft usage of action mechanics or first person shooter mechanics or the high speed sort of like a you know a more legitimate version of WarioWare, but then integrated much more seamlessly and elegantly into like a larger system. I, I think a lot of it comes down to, especially for indie, is it's got to feel like a labor of love. You know, there's got to be, there's got to be additional detail there that, that you know wasn't required, but the developer put it there in there anyways, and it just made the game all that much cooler. But 
if it's something like Dominion's four going to Dominion's five, where like if the labor love is going in a direction that just makes the game less and less accessible, then I think that's the not not the right direction to go. If if you've got something that people love, but not too many people can access, then your additional labor love should go into making it a more accessible game for more people. Yep, and the proof. Well, I mean, that's a lot to do with the target audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to play Bejeweled, but it was a major multi-million dollar, hundred, hundreds of millions, maybe even a billion dollars game. Uh, what was the other one from uh, uh, that was really big? Uh, something, something soda. Uh, Candy Crush. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yep. I mean, I, I wouldn't touch that game with a 10-foot pole, but it's a masterpiece and simplistic design. Yep. Yeah, but I think it's like... Soda Dungeon's also fun. Oh, yeah. I, I did play soda that Dungeon, game, too. <laughs> yeah. But I think some of that, uh, when uh, uh, Tom and I were talking about Dark Souls, I think a few months ago, maybe even last year, that you do need to have that target audience, but you should always be looking for ways to make your game more approachable. Because... You don't want to end up with only, you know, 5% of your consumer base actually finishing your game or even getting halfway through it. And even if you can lower that churn rate down by 5%, 3% over an hour, that can still equate to a far better game. And I think ultimately from like our topic today is that I think developers are learning some the easy way, some the hard way that people don't want to commit to very long games. They don't want to buy a game and be told, oh, this is going to be your next 800 hours of play before <laughs> you can figure it out. And if you don't learn those lessons, or if you can't figure out ways, again, to take that complexity away from the consumers, you're, you may end up with a good game, but it's not going to be a far-reaching one. Well, what about when... Uh... Uh, Dying Light came up with, oh, this game's 500 hours. And there was a bit of a backlash about that. Well, and it was also, that's a different, there's a, there is a, a period of time in the industry, right, where more gameplay equated more value. Um, but I think that was a primitive outlook on, on the mm -hmm. product space. So we're, that's starting to wear off. I mean, if it's not games as a service, then you're that that that's that overkill. You just need to have to make to justify the price that the person, the player paid for it. Yeah, I think like this is something I spoke with Chris Park about with Ark and like the original strategy. I know he was trying to go for with his games was to be these all encompassing, you know, sixty to hundred hour plus mega titles. You know, he put everything and anything he had into these games. But in a lot of cases, they were so big or so just dominating that a lot of people never got into them. And they like his concepts, but it was that, again, do you want a, the kitchen sink kind of game? But if you just like this one system or this one detail, it wasn't going to work for them. And like I think like the first one of his games that kind of shifted this was um, Skyward Collapse, which is a very fascinating yeah. strategy game. Very square down, very original. And I remember, like, when I was speaking to him around that time, like, that was his, like, first, like, quote-unquote, successful game he had in a long time, uh, uh, prior to that being AI Wars. I have a lot of love for Lost, uh, Last Federation. Mm. I mean, sticking in bullet hell into a, <laughs> a turn-based combat 4X game? Oh, my. <laughs> Oh, yes. But I know... I think that's the okay. interesting thing we're talking about, though, is theoretically, any feature from any game could be planted in a weak spot of any other game. Mm -hmm. It's just that the designers need to be adept enough or familiar enough with how that experience has worked to translate it into kind of fitting whatever that, you know, gap that needs filling is. And some people are more or less courageous, I guess, when they approach it. Although more courage isn't always the right call. Mm -hmm. But I know we are over our hour, so I've already had more than enough final points, so I will throw around to the rest of the panel here. If you have any final thoughts, anything you want to say regarding this topic, you know, whoever wants to start, feel free. I guess I'll start because I probably have to run very, very shortly. Okay. Um, 
I think what I like about this topic is that it kind of rides a trajectory in the people that devise games uh, where they master um, sort of systems. They become comfortable enough with them that they can start using them in unexpected contexts. And so to watch that happen in games is really watching, I guess, my peers do cool things. All right, uh, Seth or Ramin? Okay, I'd say if you're going to do these principles in games as a service, you should identify what are the core principles or values that are in your game that you think consumers really want. And you should design your game to have those principles from A to Z. But A should be both familiar to the player and very simple so that they can, they can come in and immediately have an easy success with it. And then as they move towards Z, you start adding in more and more complexity and more and more uh, content so that they feel like they're, they're, they've invested and they're, they're into the game enough that they don't really want to go back. And they don't want to have to do that again with another game that might possibly be as good as this one. So I think, I think Rami, uh, I think that applies to non-games as a service as well. And I think that also ties into our previous uh, dev round table on onboarding, where you, you do the slow drip and you keep the player engaged and entertained. I think the Civilization series does what you're describing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the beginning of 4X, sort of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I think it is something that a lot of developers have been, I think, subconsciously like learning or really trying to play around with in the indie space. Um, Chris mentioned earlier Slay the Spire, and again, like you, and like what Tomo just said about being able to fill in cracks of design with another system or another mechanic from a different genre, can certainly be applied. And it really does, like, open up these doors. Like, we joke about, you know, well, we can make a, a stealth-based horror driving game. I'm sure somebody could think of that. I've already got more ideas about the whole, like, making games about toast. I'm sure there is, like, an idle or QTE-driven <laughs> uh, toast-based game out there. Or we could. I'm sure the four of us could make that, right? <laughs> Skunkworks project, guys. Here there we go. We, there we go. Perfect. But I know, uh, Tom, you have to get going in a few minutes. I mean, we are right at our time. So we will end things here for this month's roundtable. As always, I'll give everyone a chance to go around, plug any projects, links, anything they're working on. And we'll once again go in our clockwise order. So over to Tomo. Um, so um, you can find our Epic Tavern uh, weekly streams at uh, Epic Tavern, Twitch TV slash Epic Tavern, and our Discord channel at um, uh, discord.gg slash Epic Tavern, where we discuss all things related to storytelling, game design, game development, and, um, and Epic Tavern. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right, to Seth. So you can find all my links down below. Um, there's quite a few of them. I'm, I've got my hands in so many pies, it's not even funny. Uh, but yeah, if you're into strategy games, you know, my stuff is definitely something you want to get into. And I want to really plug my Discord. We've got a great group of developers and content creators in there. I could use more gamers. Um, and developers and content creators, doesn't matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, my the other stuff I do uh, for Terminal Conflict and, and Strategy Mill were... We're in a state of uh, producing some some really interesting stuff, so watch this space. Or that space. <laughs> and Rami? Um, Project Loon, uh, uh, E-L-U-U-N-E. Uh, our trailer should be out in uh, May. It's going to be very cinematic. Uh, we have a white paper about to be released. Uh, we have minigame also starting in May. Uh, beta should be out uh, starting at the end of the year. Um, it's a game where not only can you play with your friends, but the game makes it as easy as possible to make new friends that you'll be playing with possibly for years. <laughs> All right. And uh, for me, of course, uh, be sure to be liking, subscribing, uh, commenting that everyone tells you to do on YouTube. And I am 
or I will be back later tonight for our regular game streams. We try to do these roundtables at least once a month. I'm going to try and do a few more themed ones as well. We're going to try to set things up. You'll find links to my Discord, Patreon, Twitter, all that over on the right-hand side. And other than that, thank you everybody for attending, whether you're watching this live or recorded. And again, uh, thank you to the round table as well, as there's banging to going on in my background as well. But uh, thank you guys for attending, and we'll be doing this again, hopefully, next month. Bye, guys. Bye, thank everybody. You, Josh. <laughs> Gentlemen. All right, have a great night, and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where is in the art and science of games. And until next time, take care.